Welcome back everyone to our next lecture um, in our series, Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. Probably one that's a little less well known compared to some of the disabilities that we've covered so far, but still one that you'll probably come across if you're working in schools and childcare centres. In my own personal experience, I've come across this quite a number of times. Um, and in many cases, actually, um, working in schools, uh, I, I wasn't even aware until a long time after I'd been working with these children or this particular child um, that, that, that that person had fetal alcohol syndrome. So I think being able to um, spot those children from a um, uh, from an educational uh, point of view, being able to come up with strategies and, and just being aware of some of the symptoms and the reasons behind behaviour and the typical symptoms and behaviours that you, you're likely to experience is quite important and it will make your life uh, a lot easier. Yeah, fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, uh, is essentially it, it's caused because the mother is drinking during pregnancy. Now that's you know I'm, I'm not commenting on whether one drink or two drinks or anything like that. Um, from the bit of research I've done, essentially um, what the doctors say is that large quantities of alcohol um, significantly increase the risk of the child having fetal alcohol syndrome. It's essentially the alcohol affecting the fetus. Um, and that's why they have it affects their brain, and it also affects them in some physical characteristics, which we'll go through later. Um, they don't know. They 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 tend to say that they don't know what level of alcohol is is safe, and obviously it differs from person to person. So that's one reason why they say just don't drink alcohol during pregnancy, because they're really that there's there's no general consensus about what level uh, is safe. The disorder has intellectual and physical impacts on the child, uh, which occurred because of the mother consuming alcohol during her pregnancy. Uh, FASD stands for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Now we'll just quickly break that one down. So fetal obviously means um, uh, uh, before birth, so it's something that happens during pregnancy. Um, Alcohol, so it clearly involves alcohol and the mother drinking alcohol. Um, it's not through any other cause. It's not one of those one in a thousand are just born with it because of genes or anything like that. It is absolutely because of alcohol. Spectrum and disorder. So we know what disorder is. Now spectrum, um, if you go back to the previous lectures, you'll know that a spectrum means that um, is, is there's a scale. So some um, children will be significantly affected and, and if there was such a scale, you could say that they're a 10 out of 10 for fetal alcohol syndrome, whereas others would be more of a 1 out of 10 or a 5 out of 10, for example. And obviously that scale doesn't exist, but it helps us sort of picture in our minds that not everyone is exactly the same. So it's not like a disorder, for example, if you're missing a leg and you have two people that are missing a leg, well, that's relatively uh, similar disability. But with fetal alcohol syndrome, it can vary quite remarkably and depend on their personality. And of course, if you're working with them in childcare centers or schools or whatnot, it can also depend on a variety uh, of other factors like um, their peers and, and the rapport that you have with them and the other staff and, and the types of activities that they're undertaking as well. Okay, <clears throat> features of FASD. Distinctive facial features, and we'll get into that a minute. Uh, in a minute, now these are probably the two. I'd, I'd say the three main ones from my point of view, having worked with some of these kids before. That obviously the facial features, although that can vary, and we're not medical professionals, so that's not necessarily as important. But you can certainly spot it. The lower intelligence and the learning delay is a clear issue uh, from an educational point of view because it does cause significant behaviour problems. So we know that if you've got children in the class and they're struggling, uh, they're embarrassed. Uh, because they can't understand something and those types of things. The first thing they'll do when they learn this very, very quickly in an early age um, uh, is to misbehave and, and, and to act out and you know, swear at a teacher or whatever and get kicked out of class. And, and that's a reaction. That's called saving face. So that's 
um, a way that the child will deal with uh, not being able to understand something. And adults are exactly the same. If you ever tried to learn anything, if you're going through this course or you're trying to learn maths or something like that, when you can't quite figure something out, um, it becomes extremely frustrating and you start blaming your trainer or you'll start saying, oh, this subject is stupid, I don't need to know this subject or this is just a waste of my time and, and all those types of things. Now, kids do exactly the same thing because they're, they're still humans after all and if they um, are struggling compared to their peers, then um, there's a good chance that they will act out. Which is another reason um, why it's important for kids um, to have the additional support, especially with fetal alcohol syndrome, um, <clears throat> spectrum disorder, sorry. Now, we did talk earlier about dyslexia, ADHD, those types of things, and, and labelling and why labelling has issues in some cases. and. You know, we, we don't really comment on, 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 on that um, as much as the, the ethical side of, uh, of that argument. Um, but with fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, it's pretty much universally accepted that a, a student, a, a child with fetal alcohol should get um, additional support because they do have, they clearly have the lower intelligence um, and, and other behavioural problems uh, associated with it in many cases. So that additional support is clearly needed um, without no one would really ever argue that. And important because otherwise the child ends up or could end up um, uh, being suspended, being expelled from 10 different schools, these types of things. Alcohol related birth defects, such as issues with the heart or kidney. Okay, what well, Alcohol consumed um, by a pregnant woman can have dramatic effects on the developing fetus. That's pretty. Um, Pretty well known, I think, unless you've been living under a rock, um, it's pretty well documented. On, I mean, they're always talking about these types of issues on TV, on the radio, in newspapers, those types of things. It affects the development of the fetuses, uh, the, the fetal nervous system, um, and developing brain cells, uh, amongst a whole variety of other stuff as well. Smaller head circumference and other visual facial features. Developmental delay affecting IQ, learning, memory, those types of things. So things to do with the brain and, and how the brain works and processes information and learns new things and, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, now some of the facts. <coughs> Fetal alcohol syndrome um, spectrum disorder is avoidable um, for obvious reasons because it is caused by the consumption of alcohol. The effects are lifelong, so it's a permanent um, uh, problem. It's not something that you can take a pill for. It's not something that goes away. Um, and obviously, while schools uh, can support children and, and do their best with children that have um, FASD, at the end of the day, um, if, if the child has an IQ of 60, then nothing you can do is going to change that. They're always going to have um, significant learning problems. Okay, um, now not all babies are affected in the same way. Um, uh, and I think that goes with any <coughs> disorder or disability. And we've been through enough of them so far to realise that almost every disorder or disability is a spectrum. Right? So um, some people, are, even if you look at cerebral palsy, I mean, some people are um, affected significantly more than others. Um, if you look at uh, autism and so on and so forth, there, there is that spectrum. So there's that range of different um, ways that people are affected and the severity in how they're affected. Okay, and again, well, this slide talks about the, the spectrum. Um, so it's a range of conditions can affect, that, that can affect the developing in utero baby. So basically, in other words, lots of different stuff can happen. No two babies are necessarily going to be the same. But there are some common characteristics that mean uh, medical professionals can classify um, a child as having FASD. Um, and there's some different uh, some different types of um, um, ASD down there, some subclassifications and some different acronyms, but we won't get into any of that stuff. You guys can go and learn that later on if you like. Now, here's a little picture 
um, from um, the internet somewhere. Smaller um, head, so that's the overall head. That's from you know not not just the forehead there, but the overall the, the whole um, head may be slightly smaller. Now those epicanthy folds, they're the eyes. That's a um, a very that's the um, a very um, um, obvious giveaway. Um, the bridge just above the nose or on the top of the nose there. Um, now that area, the thin upper lip. Um, and the philtrum, the smooth philtrum, so that's the, um, I suppose those lines between the nose and the upper lip, that's one of the main um, telltale signs that doctors use as far as I'm aware. A flat mid face, uh, underdeveloped jaw. Um, and I've also heard people talk about, um, you know, the larger sort of forehead as well, so I'm not sure if that's uh, medically uh, proven, but that's one that I have heard. Around the traps, visual facial features. There we go. Okay. okay, so lifelong aspects. So these are things that can't be changed. So again, you can give support, you can help, you can um, assist students to learn basic sort of functional tasks like how to um, go shopping and um, how to manage their finances or how to get dressed in the morning or things like that but you certainly aren't going to be able to help their IQ all that much you know they're not going to go from a low IQ of say 60 to 80 or anytime soon regardless of how good you are regardless of how um, good the teachers are in the program and things like that there are some things that are just set in stone and that is um, for all intents and purposes, um, one of them. Developmental delay, so again, that means they could be a few years behind uh, their peers. So if you're in, say, year seven, the child with FASD might be in uh, year three or year two or something like that. Uh, and again, it depends on the actual skill that you're talking about. So they may be fantastic at sport. Um, maths might not be a problem. Language acquisition and, and, and uh, emotional skills, so being able to deal with being angry or frustrated or bored, those type of things, they may be in, um, uh, 10 years behind their peers. So it really depends on the individual child. Behavioural problems, now this is the one that you'll notice working in childcare centres or in schools and um, typically, I mean, you're not going to walk around a school trying to spot kids that have fetal alcohol um, spectrum disorder. It just doesn't. That, I know some of the pictures are very obvious, but in the most part, what you'll actually notice is behaviour, and then you'll start thinking back to this lecture and think, okay, oh, well, I can actually see a few um, a few things on their on their face. Maybe they actually do have fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. And again, the one thing I will point out is when you walk into a school, there's no induction where they go through every child and say this person has this and that person has that. Quite often schools don't even know. Quite often parents will be taking their kids to see doctors or psychologists or things like that, but they won't regularly inform the schools. Sometimes they just don't get along with the teachers or they you know, they drop their kids off and disappear and that's it. Sometimes, as we've spoken about in previous lectures, kids just don't get diagnosed. They just go through the process and, um, of enrolling in school and, and they're just a kid that misbehaves and that's sort of it. They never actually ever get diagnosed. And one other thing we always talk about in these lectures is the fact that you have a lot of kids who um, may not need to necessarily be diagnosed. They may be misbehaving quite regularly, there may be behaviour problems, but yet um, I, I sometimes going and, and getting diagnosed is problematic because doctors can be very reluctant to diagnose children. It can be very expensive having to go from one doctor to the next, to specialist doctors, to psychologists, these types of things. Um, so sometimes it's just a process in, for example, rural areas um, that just never really occurs. Um, and we're talking about, we're not necessarily talking about, if we're looking at the spectrum, we're not talking about kids that are right up there on the, on the, on the far right, say they're 9 out of 10, all these types of things. We're talking about kids that are sort of, um, you know, they may have some issues there, but not enough that they would, um, that anyone would really think that they need significant additional support. Learning difficulties, um, memory problems which sort of go hand in hand in a way. Um, now the one thing, strategies for EAs, before I get onto that, the one thing we will talk about with fetal alcohol um, is the behavioural problems. Um, and I have seen um, the police have to be called for uh, one particular child. 
um, with fetal alcohol, and that's because, um, and I have seen teachers, uh, you know, locking their doors or or being attacked and things like that um, by children with fetal alcohol. So there is, in my personal experience, that element um, of acting out where the child gets to a point where they're they're practically uncontrollable. So they they can have an extreme amount of rage that is just uncontrollable. And that comes with the lower IQ, but it also comes with an emotional age um, and a cognitive age that is significantly lower than their peers. So they may be in year 10, quite big, quite strong, quite into their sport and that kind of stuff, but they may actually still have temper tantrums like they're four or five or something like that. So that's the one area um, that's, that, that I always remember. Um, working with fetal alcohol is that unpredictability and, and the issues that come with that. And you know, what I always talk about in these lectures is rapport building. So if you've got significantly good rapport with those kids, then there's a very, very small chance that they're going to punch you in the face or something like that. And and these are very rare instances, so they don't happen very often. I'm, I'm thinking of all the years I worked in schools, uh, I saw this once or I saw that once. Don't think that um, you know these things happen all the time um, and don't think that it's going to happen with every single kid that has fetal alcohol, but they are things that you may or may not come across in your time working in schools or childcare centres, especially if you're there for you know, 10 years, 20 years, that type of thing. Okay, so, and, 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 and as I just mentioned a second ago, that rapport is so super important. So even if you really don't like that particular child, even if you don't get along with them, you think, oh, Johnny, he's, God, I can't stand working with him. But, you know, from a professional point of view, get to know them as best you can. You know, I mean, ultimately, you're the adult in this relationship. So get to know them as best you can. Talk about what they do on the weekend. Talk about their foods. Joke around with them a little bit. Give them nicknames, stuff like that. Do whatever you can to get to know them, to, to try and build their self-esteem, to let them... Um, um, open up to you a little bit within reason of course because I mean, you're not trying to become too frenzy with, with people but especially as an education assistant you're very much working one on one with kids and, and if you're in a classroom where there's 20 kids where there's no real problems and there's one or two where there are um, behavioural problems and that's where you should be concentrating your effort and that's where you're that's why you're paid to be there ultimately to give that additional support you're not really needed um, as much with those kids that don't have any problems and are keeping up. Okay, um, so some of the strategies for EAs uh, and childcare workers. As a child will have poor memory and most likely have lower intelligence and be working at their level half, uh, well, generally sometimes, half of their chronological age. So chronological means um, um, are they 12, are they 13, are they 14? So if they're working at half of that, then they're a 15-year-old, then they'll be working at about the age of a 7 uh, or 8-year-old. In, in some instances, and in, in, um, uh, in, in my experience, it's not always necessarily half their chron chronological age, but definitely um, you know, they, they are the students in the class that are, that are struggling significantly and in some areas will be two or three years behind. Although it's hard to say specifically what two or three years behind means uh, because if you walk into any, say you walk into a year six class, you have some students in there that are working at year 10, others that are working at year two, really others that are not working or, or have any concept of, I've had kids before in year 11 and 12 who could barely write their name. So, uh, and, and they didn't necessarily have a disability they just haven't really been to school that much for their entire life. So you might be dealing with people that have come straight from refugee camps and spent years in refugee camps, these types of things. Okay, so um, scaffolding. Break it down into smaller parts. Uh, we've been through scaffolding, so I won't spend time on that, but it is the cornerstone of education. I mean, that's what education is all about, breaking stuff down into smaller parts and teaching it one-on-one. -on -one. Give one direction at a time, keeping things simple, easy to follow, model how to do the activity. So as with all disabilities, um, one way that is very effective is getting kids to work with their hands, that tactile um, process of picking up a, um, a football and playing around with that football in their hands and then answering some questions or doing up a graph or a table or something like that, but somehow involving actual tactile objects in as many activities as possible is very important. Now, that modelling as well, um, the um, 
modeling is again super important so if you were asking a child for example um, I don't know to do a graph then maybe you'd want to do two or three graphs um, for them first uh, and then do part of it and they can fill in the gaps and so forth and slowly push them towards being able to do things uh, more independently uh, concrete resources so the child is not an abstract learner now abstract uh, if you're not sure what abstract means then please look that up but abstract concepts uh, is, is sort of like I say like philosophies and things like that so adults struggle with um, abstract um, concepts so that may be for example if the class is having a debate um, and the debate may be about whether things like whether war is necessary uh, just as an example so abstract is not um, a simple math problem or learning how to spell or learning how to make a particular type of food abstract is more about thinking about concepts and different points of view um, visual tools, so we've spoken about visual tools, there's some examples on the right hand side over there using as much visual and things that you can touch uh, as possible to explain um, things. Uh, reward, uh, reward programs for behaviour can have a, a good effect um, and the IBP uh, and IEP. Um, and just note that depending on where you're listening to this, they do IEPs, IBPs, they're called you know, various different things as well. So you have um, behaviour modification plans and I think in some states like Queensland they have uh, uh, various different, there's one that starts with G, I can't remember it off the top of my head. So they're, they're called various different things um, uh, uh, all over the place. But essentially they, an IEP or an IBP, the E stands for education, the B is behaviour, so it's a plan for an individual, for a particular child, about how you're going to help them improve them. It puts a bit of a system around what's happening. So, the, and the plan could be as simple as basically um, the child um, often gets out, if they uh, gets out of their seat and calls out, um, and when that happens, this is what we do. And if they go this amount of time without doing that, then they get this reward. If they do this, then there's this consequence and so on and so forth. So um, they can be, sometimes you see them and they're real complicated. I'm not a big believer in, in those, except for, you know, they're typically stored away and never used and, and only used for funding purposes. Um, but you also, but the more, the more, um, um, simple you can make it within reason of course the better and quite often people have educational behavior plans and strategies they just don't have them on paper so you'll be thinking okay well what strategies am I going to use today if Johnny does X or Johnny does Y or how am I going to get him to learn X or learn Y and the typical example I'll give is um, uh, EA I was talking to recently now what they they have a child there obsessed with the playground uh, and he would literally just play for you know days on end probably and all he does is stare out the window so um, and, and if he's not allowed to play, then um, they end up basically having to restrain him. He gets to the point where um, the, they're acting out um, to, to such a degree. Now, uh, that's pretty common in your special needs centres. There is a lot of, um, on, on many occasions, the EAs will restrain kids. Now, um, for that, their strategy and what they're doing, their plan um, really is that if you do 10 minutes of work, you can go play for 10 minutes. You know, and, and, and then if we do 15, 20 minutes of work, then you can go play for eight minutes. And they're slowly closing that window down. Uh, and they notice significant improvements you know, over a longer period of time. It may take six months, it may take 12 months. Sometimes they get these kids and they come from other places where they haven't had those. They've been allowed to do pretty much whatever they want. And, um, and they have to sort of get them in line a bit and teach them how to behave in schools. Okay. Impulse control, so we've already spoken about impulse control, so that's if you look at a toddler for example who has uh, no emotional control and, and a toddler will um, have their temper tantrums in the middle of a shopping centre and those types of things. So kids with fetal alcohol syndrome have that element of impulse control. If you're not sure what that means then just think of toddlers and how they behave if they're a little bit tired or they're a little bit cranky and stuff like that. And I don't think necessarily the kids with fetal alcohol, um, if they're 13 or whatever, or whatever are going to be at that level, um, but it just gives you an idea to sort of wrap your head around what impulse control means. And, and what it can look like in a school. Um, behavior and consequences. Okay, so poor executive functioning. So executive functioning um, is about being able to make decisions, you know, being able to think, ah, oh, my friends are, um, you know, my, my friends are, I'm talking, I'm going to start talking, but I'm at the other side of the classroom, so I'm going to yell out. Whereas, you know, a lot of kids would recognize that that's something they shouldn't be doing. But kids with fetal alcohol may not um, think in advance. 
um, uh, uh, or be able to control that impulse when they want to socialize. Emotional outbursts, impulsive feelings. Um, a child is unaware of boundaries especially young kids. There's, there's always issues uh, working in special needs centres and with these types of kids if, um, or kids with disabilities in general, especially uh, kids with ASD or autism and whatnot when they're going through puberty, for example. Learning the connection between behaviour and the consequence um, is not always obvious. Uh, be careful with discipline strategies. Um, so really, instead of using, typically we don't use the word discipline anymore, but really talking about um, natural consequences for you know, chosen behaviour, I suppose. Uh, but again, that's what that's point five says. Be careful with discipline and the idea of discipline, and be careful with punishment and so on and so forth. Because um, you're really looking at having consequences, yes, but consequences that over time improve their behaviour. If it's not improving their behaviour, then you know you, it, it's it's it, there's no point. You know? Um, it's just causing stress and anger and frustration on um, everyone's part. You need to have strategies and processes in place that improve their behaviour over time. That's what you're really ultimately aiming for. So more strategies for EAs. Uh, watch for warning signs for unwanted behaviours and redirect their attention. So that goes with all kids, but that's just picking it up early. You know, if you if you notice that. Um, you know, let's say there's a relief teacher in and, and the lesson is kind of boring and there's nothing really going on. See if you can do something slightly different with that particular child because you may uh, see the warning signs coming and think, ah, okay, something, he's going to start really um, losing control soon. And, and when he gets a bit hyped up and, and starts um, running around, then that's where problems occur. Acting out can happen, so find out what is causing the distress or frustration. Um, now, that, that of course, uh, and, and, and it can be that the work is simply too hard, trying to concentrate for too long. Um, now, we spoke about before having black and white rules for things, so classrooms obviously, no, quite often, no hat in the classroom, this kind of stuff. So you'll have these black and white rules that no one, everyone must follow these rules. But the consequences for different children can be different. Quite often, um, a student may simply forget, you know, and walk in a classroom. So, would you absolutely punish them, and um, would there be a horrible consequence? Well, probably not. You know, if you just said, "Johnny, take your hat off," that'd be fine. But if Johnny continued to put his hat on again in class, and they were really pushing the boundaries, then that would be a whole different situation. And if you remember from the bump method, or you might not have got to that yet, but um, Johnny's then upping um, what. Um, you would need to do. So it's going from that low level bump one type stuff where you're saying, Johnny, please don't do that, to the next level, to the next level, where there needs to be stronger consequences or where you need to actually start paying attention to that behaviour. Praise the small achievements made instead of focusing on what needs to be improved. Okay, so I guess that's just about being sort of positive. Even if a student gets you know a couple of things right, or at least if their handwriting's neat, commenting on positive things. And we do that with adults as well. So adults love praise, and they need praise, they need encouragement. Um, if every time you handed an assessment into us, and you know we sent it back and said, "Yeah, it's it's ninety percent correct," but oh my God, the answers you gave to this was just horrible. Um, and your handwriting, your spelling—I mean, everything—it was just a nightmare to mark. You know, it's it's just horrible. Like what you've handed in is disgusting. Then what are the chances of you handing the next assessment in? I'd say the the number of students that drop out would be quite significant. So we always make sure that um, even though there are rooms for improvement, uh, that we always um, let students know that if they've done something well, then we let them know that they've done something well. Set small achievable goals, rewards program, use role play uh, for teaching social skills. So that role play, again, um, we've covered social stories before, so that's uh, in that realm. If you use something of a timeout, half the time normally given for a child their age, uh, because they may forget why they're there. Remember a child with fetal alcohol may act and think like someone half their chronological age. So if you're dealing with someone that's in year seven, remember that, you know, say a 12, 13 year old, remember that um, in their mind, in their brain, the way they're thinking, they're actually at about the age of uh, someone that's still in kindy. More strategies ensure that you have the child's attention before speaking. Um, now, in some of the previous ones, uh, some of the previous lectures, uh, so dyslexia, for example, we're talking about this. Now, that's uh, in a way it's called filtering. Now, filtering is um, a, um, um, and I think they, 
some people call it the cocktail party effect and that's being able to be in a room where there's say 30 people there's all this lots of noise lots of stuff's going on and it's being able to shut everything out and concentrate uh, on the one person that's talking to you now that's a natural skill that humans typically have maybe it's a learned skill who knows but um, some children with disabilities struggle with that and they can't filter out that noise and all they can hear is 30 conversations or 30 people talking gibberish that they don't because they can't obviously process that much at once um, and they can't focus specifically uh, on one person. Checking for understanding. Um, have the child tell you um, what you want from them and repeating back what you want from them. Using literal language, so being very clear, not using sarcasm or um, speaking too fast, those types of things. Uh, include hand gestures and pointing to objects, avoiding metaphors uh, and sarcasm, speaking clearly. Um, jokes may not be understood, they may need more explaining. Um, minimize background noise when talking to the child. Now, the one thing I will say about children with disabilities that becomes pretty obvious is, and the same with um, people that speak English as a second language, even adults, they become absolute experts of making you think that they understood when they don't actually understood or don't actually have a clue of what's going on. So they become very good at and used to saying, oh yes, okay, I understand that, no problems. And then they turn around and don't know and then they don't actually know. And the person that has given them the instruction um, will, um, will think that the student understands, um, but the student is just sort of smiling and, 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 and nodding, but without actually having an understanding of specifically what needs to be done. I'm generalizing here, of course. Okay, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed that lecture. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope it was informative. Now, fetal alcohol um, is a, it's pretty common, and it's very common in some states, more so than other states. Um, there are clusters of schools and families um, where you have two, three kids, these types of things, with fetal alcohol. So you may be in a school where you've got multiple siblings with fetal alcohol that seems to be quite common in my experience as well especially in rural areas um, so you never know you may end up working with these types of kids very very uh, regularly and just bear in mind too that fetal alcohol is something that may occur um, as part of a multiple disability as well so you, not only do you have the base disorder for lack of a better description the, the main disorder I guess but you've also got other issues that you need to deal with if you're taking kids out for sport and they were talking earlier about heart problems and liver problems so that's another uh, it's an aspect of the disorder but it's almost a disorder to itself um, visual issues hearing issues um, a significantly low IQ um, and so on and so forth and I think I could be wrong but to put it in context um, I, I think they've recently changed it I think it's 60 a score of 68 to about 72 uh, on the IQ test uh, means children can access funding or be considered um, special needs so being a special needs center and get the funding and all that kind of stuff so that's testing that a school or district psychologist would undertake uh, they would give the student an IQ and that IQ um, if they fall into certain categories um, then they'll get so much funding and, and so on and so forth and I think so fetal alcohol they're saying at about 60 um, the, the information that um, is in this PowerPoint and um, about 70 or so uh, is the level that's needed as far as I'm aware I could be wrong but it's in that general realm bearing in mind for those that don't know much about IQ 100 is considered to be um, the average so when they work out the questions, 100 is the norm of a particular of, of people. So 100. So if you're a little bit above 100, then then you're higher. If you're a little bit below, um, then you're a little bit below the the what is considered to be average. Very interesting the IQ stuff, especially if you look at um, the IQ um, um, levels of people. Say 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we are certainly getting smarter as far as completing IQ tests, problem solving, those types of things. Um, the IQ tests, I heard someone say um, recently that they are getting significant, they are getting harder and harder compared to what they used to be because otherwise everyone is scoring really high and of course the average needs to be 100. So if you took an IQ test today and you were 100 uh, and you took the IQ test from 40 years ago, then you'd probably be, I don't know, 120 or something like that.